everybody hear me? I expect you probably can hear me without this, but uh, <laughs> I'm David Griffiths. I'm the Director of Research for the Department for Continuing Education, which doesn't mean to say I do everybody's research mm -hmm. for them. It just means I help to coordinate across all our different subjects, because this is, of course, very important that we have a multidisciplinary department, which is really the only one in Oxford. And I think it's uh, a very, very special department for that reason. And it's very important that we have a graduate seminar that, that recognises that and brings everybody together across the subject lines, which is why these seminars are so interesting and why the themes are so interesting as well. Uh, we could set themes which are very particular to reading, or not. I have a very dangerous uh, <laughs> microphone here. Um, we could set themes that are very particular to one or other subject, um, but there, there are the broad themes, and we like our speakers to interpret them in their own way. And tonight, the theme is danger, which sounds a bit off putting, really, doesn't it? Since we all recognise that international symbol of the skull and crossbones and danger in various different languages, uh, very often seen at the edge of minefields and all that kind of thing, but also seen over. It's something we tend to sort of avoid, really. Uh, but danger has a, a, a whole wealth and realm of different applications, both uh, psychologically and physically in our lives. And uh, it is part of our culture as well as simply uh, something to avoid in our everyday life. And notions of danger, I think, are really important to explore and to try to understand. And that's what we're trying to do today. Um, I'll get on to the theme of the next one, which is perhaps even less uh, kind of alluring in some ways in a second. Um, that's, in fact, chaos. Um, <laughs> so we're going downhill a bit. <laughs> the one after that probably be the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, we, we, we're always looking for, for new themes which, which appeal to our graduate community. Um, we've sort of set these up for the next uh, few months, but if anybody has any ideas as to how we can keep this seminar going in a lively and vibrant way, which brings everybody together, which is the intention, um, then please do get in touch with me or Liz, Liz Sanders, who has really organised this and is the sort of spirit behind it. So we'd like to thank Liz to start with for all her hard work in putting the programme together. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, I'd just like to uh, give you a little bit of information about what's happening later. Firstly, to go back to the next seminar on chaos, that's on the 7th of November, okay? Two days after bonfire night. Um, and Claire, our colleague Claire and Marty, is going to be speaking of that. I don't think we know who the other speakers are yet. It's a little bit chaotic, really, isn't it? <laughs> but... Um, it won't be chaotic by the time we get to the 7th of November, we'll have three speakers. And if any of you, as people who attend the seminar, feel prompted or motivated to speak about chaos, which of course is like danger, it has a lot of different applications like chaos theory and so forth. It's a Greek word, so it's at the root of our Western culture, really, the word chaos. And if that inspires you, then please do come forward, because we're very, very keen to have Phil and other graduate students speak at this seminar and not just members of the teaching staff. So a bit later on this evening after we finished our seminar here, um, we'll be having drinks in the common room just down off the courtyard there, so everybody's welcome to that. And if you have booked in for the meal, uh, which some of us are going on to after that, that's at half past six, 6.30 in the Ruby House dining room. So I can now move on in my final two minutes before we get to uh, 4.40 to introduce. I think it might be best if I, instead of doing it in bits as we go through and interrupting the flow, if I introduce the speak, three speakers at the start, um, and then it will hopefully become clear how their different areas of interest in their work. So if I impinge upon the theme for tonight... Um, the first speaker is Marion Kabuka. Um, Marion's a midwife, 
and is doing the defill in evidence-based healthcare. And uh, there's a very long list of achievements here, uh, but um, it's uh, a, a really interesting background. And Marion's theme is up here: dangerous childbirth, developing a systematic <coughs> approach to maternal safety. After Marion's done her contribution, we'll be turning to Yasmin Khan, who's a colleague here in history. And Yasmin uh, has been working uh, on the history of Asia, and uh, her theme is on the Bengal famine, which is absolutely fascinating. And it's not widely known that this happened in the middle of the Second World War. And uh, it's a part of the history of the Second World War that I think a lot of people need to know more about, really. And subsequent to Yasmin's contribution, we turn to Anna, Anna Beer, uh, who is a, also a colleague here in the department. She's currently uh, directing the creative writing course, is the master's course, I mean. But Anna was, for, for, for a number of years, a, a lecturer in English here in continuing education and, and, and a very uh, lively and vibrant colleague at that time. And uh, we're very pleased to have Anna back uh, in the department to do this. So if I could um, turn to Marion to start with, to start off the seminar, and uh, then we'll obviously swap as we can get to the right point. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm not here to scare you about <laughs> childbirth, so if you haven't had a child, childbirth can be quite a normal and midwives, we are here to provide that service to promote normality. And um, I, I wrote ch Dangerous Childbirth because I was looking at minority of women who suffer the third and fourth degree tears. I'm going to go through that later on, what they mean. Um, just I wanted you to know that childbirth can be right normal <laughs> and about 90% about, uh, women uh, go home happy. Um, uh, however, the third and fourth degree tear is not normal. And midwives, as midwives, we have to do everything possible to normalize uh, childbirth. And my project is looking at positions in the second stage of labor, but I'm looking at one um, type of upright position, which is squatting. That is why I've got my stool here. <laughs> it is like... Um, a toilet seating uh, position, but it is fantastic for childbirth. However, it has been controversial that it is one of um, the factors which can cause third and fourth degree tear. Uh, it is my project is not about um, this topic alone. It covers other areas, the benefits of squatting and the care given to mothers by midwives during ch uh, childbirth. So th this is a small section of my research. So um, in this um, seminar, I'm just going to talk through about, uh, about uh, vaginal tear, tears, the severe vaginal tears, squatting position, and how I'm going to go about this um, study, investigation. Child Childbearing can be one of the most special events in a woman's life. However, it can also be one of the most dangerous. Those are the topics I'm going to talk about. Third degree and fourth degree tear, what do they mean? I brought that. This is a very busy um, picture. I wanted Do you want to use this because right. you, can, you yeah. can use the red dot and you can use those buttons to go back and forwards on your slides. As you see, um, normally what we call normal is a vaginal tear from there to so, sort of there. But as it goes to near to uh, a bowel muscle, this is bowel muscle around here and around here. This is where the third degree is. So um, a tear could happen everywhere, ev anywhere here, 
but we don't want it to happen around the bow because what happens is that, um, let me tell you, this is up to there, up to there it could be third degree tear and it up to there, but if it extends then it is, um, it is a fourth degree tear, that is the difference. So the difference is the intensity of the tear. The more you tear, the more you tear from there to there to there to there, the more you are going to suffer the symptoms. What we normally would like, what we call normal, is just not to go near here. I will show you another picture. You can use the stick. Oh, sorry. This one, okay. Can I use this one to be quicker? Right. Uh, right. As you can see here, this is a, a very good picture showing you how it can be. This is a normal pregnant woman having a baby, but the tear can come up to here and deep. So we don't want a tear around there. So here we have what we call um, an incision, uh, where we, which we call episiotomy. I don't know whether any one of you have heard of that term, but it is only an intentional surgeon, <laughs> a surgical incision, just to make it a bit wider, just in case a baby is, what we want the baby to come out quickly, or we think that you are going to have a, um, a bad tear, you are bleeding from inside out, um, uh, the midwife will have to judge that uh, to, to see how to do it. Normally, we do it on the side, as you see, lateral, so that we don't go close in the middle. What they say, one of the uh, risk factor of a third degree tear is uh, 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 this episiotomy, this card, right in the middle. That is the uh, top, uh, top um, cause of that degree tear. Um, another risk factor for these tears is, as you can see there, you can, you can get prolapse. You see there? It is a prolapse. This one, I don't know how to get it properly. The, it is hidden here, but that one, the A is well neat, um, well sutured um, physiotomy or a tear. But this one, you ha are having some problems with your, with your body, with your vaginal wall. So that you start getting some sort of, um, you can get um, urine, uh, urine infections and you can get urine incontinence, you can get um, bowel incontinence. Yeah, so it really, third and fourth degree tears affect the quality of life for women. Uh, what is the incidence of this? It is only a minority women. 85% women during childbirth can sustain a sort of vaginal tear. However, only 0.5 to 3% women can, have, can sustain third to fourth degree tear. Um, and my, my study is looking at squatting. So I'll go back to that later on. Squatting, I've got some pictures. What I thought would be easy is just imagine yourself on the toilet. That is <laughs> what we call uh, a supported squatting. It is mainly more a Western sort of culture because they can't do the unsupported squatting. They are not really um, culturally, that is what they feel. However, they can do it if as midwife we support them and we make them more uh, comfortable in this position. What is more important for midwives is to make a woman maintain the most comfortable position she feels. However, as midwives we need to 
to know a variety of positions to be partners of care so that we can help her to find this position. That is our role. Um, so there are two types, a supported squatting and un unsupported squatting. You can have a look at that. That is on the bed. You can have it on the bed, on the floor. I got this, these pictures from, I Googled them. And these are the same pictures we use. And that is on the bed, and it's got a um, pole. So you can just hold on and push. And another one, that is a, a, a obstetric chair. That is also supported. And that one is a normal uh, bed. And we have that one is a, a tiny footstool, which can also be okay. Uh, within, within these positions, you can change them any as you want. But when they get to the second stage of labor, women don't want to change so much because that is very important. Second stage of labor is when a baby is, is ready to come. We have what we call passive second stage, and we've got active second stage. The passive second stage, a woman is not really pushing. He's just letting uh, everything happen naturally. However, the active second stage is when the woman just feels that she really needs to get this baby out. And one of the advantages of squatting, it is a natural way of having a baby. And if left alone with that intervention, they, they think that 90% of women can squat during birth, during labor, uh, because it is a natural way. They just go and try to help themselves. That is the way they can help feel better. And it also helps with the pain. And that is another obstetric chair where you get much support. So those are sort of the support and different positions uh, you can have. There are others which are on the floor um, and others on uh, different chairs and, and using pillows, which I did, not, I did not have. So those are the types of positions. What is the incident of having uh, squatting? As you can see, this is a UK This is a UK survey which was done in 2010. And during this first, sec uh, first stage of labor, about 4% women use squatting position. As you can see, it is only three in the second stage who use this position. Mostly they use semi-recumbent uh, that is on the bed, lying flat, having a baby. Yeah, so majority um, semi-recumbent uh, and minority are sporting. Um, I, will, I will have to look at what evidence we have um, which talks about why we're having these sort of differences, which um, I've, I've, I've gathered quite a lot of information on squatting. Um, however, it does not reflect uh, clinic, clinical at all. Controversy. The controversy of squatting, which I feel that it may be one of the um, contributors of having very low, um, people, very low women using squatting, is that um, there are publications which are saying that squatting is a risk factor for severe uh, perineal trauma. However, as I said, that um, in as a, a midwife, some of where, where I'm going to do this study, there is no sort of training for student midwives about squatting. Uh, but you s the majority of of women um, um, are cared for when they are on the bed. So when you go out, when you qualify, the most easy position you have seen so many times would be the semi-recumbent. That is one of the, um, the theory behind it. However, it doesn't take away the effectiveness and the naturalness of squatting. Um, and as I go on, I have, I have 
some sort of studies. The three studies up, up here, all of those, as you can see, I told you the average for first time mom, it is 3% um, risk of having a, a, a third or fourth degree tear. But when you look at this, it is more. So some people, some midwives, are taking this seriously. Whereas some midwives are looking at these. So this is the controversy I have for my study. Uh, these three are retrospective studies. This one is a retrospective study, but it has different outcomes. And this one is a Cochrane review of systematic reviews. And that one is a prospective study of um, uh, uh, observational uh, study. This is my comparison. I haven't done this research. I'm still looking at the background. And um, one of these studies was a Cochrane review, which did not find that squatting position is a risk factor. And that, and that one did not find that. However, these are the three did. Um, the hierarchy of evidence, level one, a, um, systematic review, a hierarchy of evidence, level one. However, the author told us to take the, 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 the results with caution because uh, there was a lot of heterogeneity. Um, these two, the hierarchy of evidence is level two. So by that, you would take that to be your center for practice. We also have, with the Cochrane and RCT, most of them are the control confounders. There was some control of confounding factors for this study, but there was no, because you work from outcome to cause. So you, you cannot control confound, confounders. These are the things which I feel that needs to be explored. I need to explore. And there is also selection bias in those studies. What, what um, I'll go back to this. What I found interesting is that there are some guidelines we have a national guideline, the NICE guidelines, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. It does not mention any of them. However, the Royal College of Midwife, in their guideline, they mention only one of them. And they put it as a, a high risk factor. They mention others, but not on, on, not on squatting. And also you will find that midwives, also you will find that midwives in practice, there are some who feel that it do have some sort of a cause. And there are others who feel that they're not. So these are the factors which affect practice. Um, my I'm going to look at a systematic review, I'm going to do an overview of systematic review and I'm going to look at most of these studies and um, um, I'm going to um, supplement the interventional uh, reviews with qualitative studies to see really what is the uh, factor and then what has been mentioned to be uh, useful is to use the nominal group technique, um, which is a group of midwives, clinical midwives, who have got experience in squatting, who can inform practice. Uh, with where you have, um, where you, there is conflict, or, or there is a co inconclusive sort of um, evidence, these two have been uh, one of the um, methods to help out.
So I'm going to look, uh, I'm going to use, nominal group will be using midwives, clinical midwives and women who have um, squatted before um, to inform practice. And with Delphi, that you can use Delphi for national and international people who are more experts um, in squatting, who have published a lot of work um, in this method. Uh, after this, I will generate all my data and I will uh, I'm trying to develop a training package for midwives to help in, in clinical practice. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> We do have the opportunity for a couple of questions now, if anyone would like to ask them. Can you say something about, again, humanities person, forgive me for Do you want to, um, there's, there's a thing here. Uh, uh, one of the things that strikes me about your study is this wonderful intersection between cultural factors and scientific data. And I'm wondering, are you finding that a, a productive generator of your research? Do women hesitate over adopting or rejecting the principle of, of this position based on you know, fears of decorum even <laughs> that may lead one to feel less comfortable with one birth process than the other? Is that something you've been a, a sort of qualitative data that would be interesting that juxtaposed with the quantitative? To be honest with you, women want the safest. Once you support them, and at the second stage of labor, they want everything. They've been going through labor, especially first time moms, where they are struggling, this is new to them. They can do anything you tell them. All they need is somebody who is there to listen and support. So what I feel that it is up to the midwife to really have knowledge and skill of caring for those mothers. And once you support them properly, if they can just say, I'm not comfortable, and you say, can you try another position? <clears throat> there are also some few women who are where the baby is not in a good position. It is really up to you to tell them that, you know, if you are going to go through a long, a long labor and painful, if you try to move pos uh, into this position, it will help you to move the baby. As, as you are contracting, the baby also turns because the baby responds to those contractions. But if you are in a wrong position, obviously the baby is going to stay in that wrong position and you are going to be in a long sort of pain. So they normally listen to you and as a, a midwife you just need to check that and just give them an informed choice. very interested whether you're looking at first-time moms, which you just mentioned, um, only. And if you have age groups and women who've already perhaps had bad or good experiences, be more influenced in the sense to discuss it with you before than perhaps even the first-time moms. So I wonder if you're looking at that. I'm looking at Sorry, both. Bit, I'm looking at both because both has a risk. Um, I know the risk mm -hmm. for second time mom is not 0.8, so it is a bit low. However, I'm looking at both because both utilize the service. Mm -hmm. They both can utilize the service, and they can tell us what they did their second time, what it, what how it helped, mm -hmm. or what was um, how we can change. All you want is what we have done which is good, and what we have done, which is not so good, we can look at change. Um, and, and they are the ones who are going to tell us the differences of the positions. And I'm looking at also for them to define to me the different, you saw the different positions uh, I, uh, I showed. Uh, there are beds and chair and uh, floor. What, what is the best for them at what stage? So they are the ones to be home. Any more questions? Or thoughts or ideas? I think I can see it. Oh, okay. Okay, so the form might not be a 
great question, but um, I was struck by it, but also the sort of cultural element potentially. Um, have you looked, I know this is just the British sort of study, but do you know whether this is typical for Europe or how it is, you know, is this embraced when it comes to different cultures in different ways? Or, you know, have you looked at just the rest of Europe? Is this just a British phenomenon that it's being rejected in a way or not being practiced as much? Yeah, sure. I've looked at Netherlands, they are the queen of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to utilize, if, if they are, I'm going to utilize their service mm -hmm. because they, are, they have looked into it and they are, most of the publishers are from them. So um, they are, I think, they have the majority of home births. You find these sort of positions mainly in home births or in middle three laid units where it is more uh, practiced. Um, the good thing in Britain that we've got um, maternity-led cares now, where we have all of these, and all, we have also this stream, so we are trying to get to get there, but we have to have like a standard sort of care um, that is uh, before we get there. So we have to look at what has been happening and what will happen. Benefit women. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, I was just. Roger? Just a quick question. Can you talk into the thing? Yeah. It's because it's being recorded, that's why. Right. Um, I assume that there are a number of risk factors, and I may be naive in this, but I would have thought that the size of the baby would be very material in the case of tears. Um, are there studies that have tried to take out or to separate out that particular factor and look at residual factors, so treating um, the position uh, at the time of birth uh, as a residual factor, significant, but nonetheless with the risks generated by size eliminated or taken out? There are other factors. Uh, as I say, one of the leading ones is the cut, yeah, is the, 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 the incision. Uh, that is one leading one. There is big baby. There is if you are on the table. Um, however, the reason I'm bringing the squatting, it is not preliminary there yet, but they, um, they are some confiners with positions. So positions, some studies are saying they are, other studies are saying they're not. That is an interesting question because when you look at the retrospective studies, they did not report the, uh, how big the baby was. Also, as I mentioned, that the more presentation of the baby, the baby comes in a more quiet position. So sometimes it aggravates the tear. They did not mention anything like that. And I am also wondering, which I did not say, I'm also wondering it is how squatting is used. Because you find that some studies are saying that squatting is used as a last resort. After a prolonged labor, they think, let's try this. <laughs> so that is where it is minority uses it. However, if it is used initially, it would have shortened labor, it would have made things much quicker. I think those are the things which I'm going to look at in depth later on. Thank you very much for that. I think we ought to move on. Thank you very much, Marian. Uh, very, very fascinating. Uh, however, uh, However squeamish I might have felt. Can we just say Yasmin for her calm self <laughs> um, The um, uh, one thing that came out of that presentation was how uh, evidence-based healthcare works as a as a subject of research. Which I think is important to be able to understand that as well. Um, I like to think of myself as an evidence-based archaeologist, but we haven't got as far as actually inventing that concept yet. But uh, thanks very much for that. That was fascinating. Um, 
Are you going to be using that? Well, in that case, I'll just blank it out for a second. Oops. So Yasmin is, is next, um, and uh, a bit more history here. Um, thank you, Yasmin. So I'm going to talk about something completely different, <laughs> uh, which is the Bengal famine, which took place in 1943. And when Liz sent around the, the idea for this seminar, I thought of this subject because, um, because it happened in 1943 that there was a famine that took place in India where three million people um, died. And uh, as David said, it's not widely known that that took place in 1943 in the middle of the Second World War under um, British imperial power during the, during the Raj. But I think in terms of the theme of danger, there's a couple of ways that the famine is really interesting because it, it happened at the crux of two competing dangers. On the one hand, you had fascism in East Asia, you had the rise of the Japanese, and you had this danger of, of war. Um, and at the same time, you had the danger of famine approaching. The two are sort of interlinked but one took priority over the other. And for the, for the military commanders and for the British administrators at that time, the war was prioritized at every, at every turn over the civilian danger that was looming. So um, it's, it sort of stands at that crux between those two things. And as part of that, the second element is the inability of people on the ground at the time to foresee this danger that was, was occurring. And as early as 1942, there were people who were using the word famine. I mean, Gandhi actually mentioned the word famine in the context of Bengal in 1942. Um, there were others, um, including an American economist who, who used the word famine, said famine might be approaching. But lots of people didn't foresee the danger that was coming. So suddenly you have this calamity that erupts in the summer of 1943. Um, so we, we all know about Stalingrad and Hiroshima and other things to some extent, but I think the Bengal famine has a, has a, there's a case to be made for integrating it into wartime tragedies when we think about the scale and the numbers of people who were killed. I'm going to read um, from, from a book that I'm, I'm sort of trying to finish at the moment and um, that is about the, the Second World War in general um, in India. And so I'm just going to read some of the extracts some extracts from that about the famine and, and what happened at that time. Now, the, the, first, and the first element of that is just that food was already a precarious, access to food was already a precarious substance. It was already a, a precarious um, situation in India before the famine. The famine's partly on a continuum with, um, food shortage, with wider food shortages. Government attitudes towards food shortages consistently took metropolitan ideas of sacrifice and making do as their reference point. These were ideas transferred from the British home front. The government severely overestimated the Indian peasant's ability to cut back, living as he or she often did on the margins of viable existence in the first place. As the Boer Committee Report on Public Health in India had already established, most Indians had a diet that was defective in quality at the start of the war. A clerk in full-time government service was simply unable to afford to support the calorific and nutritional needs of a family of four. Milk, eggs and meat were rare luxuries even in towns. Almost a third of people regularly consumed less calories than they actually needed for their basic energy requirements. When food shortages hit Assam, the government communique told people that military requirements are bound to take precedence over others, as a quote, and that this was just one more aspect of our sacrifice in the case of the war effort. People were advised to grow more soybeans and onions, rice and lentils. And this attitude may have been applicable in Britain, um, where people had enjoyed a surplus, but was hardly relevant to subsistence sharecroppers already on the edge of life. The broader picture of food supply was one of shortage and competition for so resources, even beyond the famine-struck regions of Bengal. Widespread famine of the nature of 1943, though, is, however, of a different order altogether. It leaves lasting imprints on the demography of a region by affecting marriages, births, and deaths. It brutalizes people, forcing stark choices about who will live and die, and it pushes people into leaving their homes. It's often accompanied by disease, by crime, and by banal evil. Paradoxically, it was soldiers from the Indian Army who were posted thousands of miles away who were among the first to raise the alarm about the approach of the famine. 
or at least among the first to be believed about the gravity of the scenario unfolding in the villages of Bengal. Sipoys, and that just means Indian soldiers, they received letters from their families stressing the rising prices, the terrible local conditions and the difficulties of getting hold of essentials. And censorship officers saw the contents of these letters. By 1943, the volume of letters reaching the Middle East had increased, and many of these included a note of desperation and anxiety. As a Bengali from Renegut wrote, many people can hardly get one meal a day and are almost half clad. If the war goes on for another few months, we'll die of starvation. You can never imagine the plight of the people here, and it's impossible for me to describe it adequately. The military censor explained such letters as exaggeration and fell back on the old line that families were trying to get a greater remittance from their serving sons by writing about higher prices. Yet as 1943 went on, and many letters repeated the same complaints, while letters from Britons also described the horror and the shame of the, the famine that was ap approaching, it was readily apparent to Indian soldiers as far away as Egypt and Cyprus that India was facing an emergency. Here in the cities, it's hell, wrote one correspondent to a serving soldier. In 1943, letters varied according to another censorship report, as varying from the angry and frustrated to the hopelessly heartsick. The tables were turned and fears about the death of sons in battle were equaled by soldiers' own fears about their families facing high prices, malaria and even starvation back home. On 16th of May 1943, an unnamed sepoy somewhere in the Middle East wrote to his brother in Urdu. He described how when newcomers and new recruits arrived from India, they told of the conditions back in the home country. They, reportedly, they repeatedly reported the staggering increases in the price of food. Whenever it happens, we're grieved so much that it can't be described, he wrote. It brings sadness to my heart, wrote another sepoy from a transit camp the following day. An avalanche of letters flowed to theatres across the Middle East, reporting unimaginable prices, relatives struggling to make ends meet, and shortages of other essentials like kerosene for cooking and lighting, oil, cloth and grain. A Bengali fitter's wife from the devastated district of Midnapur wrote, people have no food to live on and no cloth to cover themselves. It's beyond imagination and unique in the history of mankind. I'm in a fix and don't know what to do. I don't want to write to you in detail so as not to increase your agony. Soldiers faced the pressure to return home. They could purchase grain at subsidised prices from control shops, while their families were often unable to do so. Senior officers saw the agonies of their men and the discontent brewing among them. There was little comfort for men from poor rural districts knowing that their families might be facing hunger while they enjoyed army rations. Don't forget here, I eat eight chapatis in one meal, while you probably cook eight chapatis for the whole family, wrote another. Even the longing for home leave began to lose its appeal. What's the use of coming on leave to starve, wrote one candidly. Long postal delays and unreliable news added to the soldiers' angst. The remittance sent back to their relatives um, increased. The soldiers were sending back more of their wages. The letters had more and more desperate tone to them. The officers censoring the letters initially removed anything too inflammatory, Deletions made whenever an alarmist tendency was noticed, he wrote. But as the crisis went on, the census reports admitted that there were letters painfully urgent in tone and an increase in sepoy pay was recommended. For all ranks, news of children and how best to look after the children recurred as a subject of their letters. A Subadar major writing in Gurmukhi told his wife, it simply tortures me to learn that my children undergo such hardships when he learned that they were queuing for food. So what was the descent into famine and how did the famine take place? Well, the steps towards famine occurred slowly but steadily. On 16th of October 1942, a cyclone had swept through districts of Bengal and Orissa, wiping out standing crops, livestock, paddy stores, and causing loss of life. Shortages had already set in and price rises had already commenced. These hit the price of rice, which was the, the main uh, subsistence food in, in Bengal. There was no rationing system in place. People started to skip meals, to take inflated offers from money, money lenders, to drink the water that their rice had boiled in as a substitute for a meal, and to beg from their neighbours. They trekked long distances at the news of rumoured food, only to find bear markets or to buy a small bag of poor quality grains at sky-high prices. Desperation set in. Labourers without land or surplus began to arrive in Calcutta and in other towns in need of food. 
By January 1943, people in Calcutta were calling for rationing, and by March, journalists from the Statesman newspaper were describing seeing something akin to starvation in the rural districts of Bengal. An ill-advised and invasive uh, food drive by the provincial government, so where officers went out to try and see how many stocks there were, um, drove supplies underground and off the open market in some places. By mid-May, the price of rice had nearly quadrupled in Calcutta. Yet it was only in the summer, as the monsoon rains approached, when semi-naked, starving people were already falling to their knees on the pavements of Calcutta, that the government fully took stock of the tragedy that was unfolding. I'm sorry to have to trouble you with so dismal a picture, wrote the ineffective governor of Bengal, John Herbert, to the Viceroy on 2nd of July, but Bengal is rapidly approaching starvation. The sight of the victims could no longer be avoided. Hollow eyes and sockets, skin like paper and with protruding bones, the dead and dying were now sometimes indistinguishable. Without health care, pure, pure sources of water or basic sanitation, deaths were now occurring from cholera, malaria and typhoid. Many starving orphans, mothers with babies and single women could be seen on the streets of Calcutta and women tended to survive the famine marginally better than men. Families had also fractured under the strain of impending death with the sick, the aged and the weak abandoned or separated. At every turn, both the elected government and the central authority from Delhi and London failed to apprehend the situation or to act before it was too late. The wealthy came into closest proximity with the famine when they saw corpses outside their homes or workplaces or dodged stepping on bodies. The historian John Mukherjee has recently analysed the disposal of corpses, which was becoming a pressing problem for the municipal authorities in Calcutta by this point, with the grisly named Corpse Disposal Squad being formed. Fuel shortages inhibited cremation. Bloated bodies could be seen in waterways and on the streets. The names or identities of the victims were difficult to ascertain. Ultimately, the authorities settled on identifying corpses sim simply by whether they were Hindu or Muslim and relied on the assistance of religious organisations for disposing of the dead by cursory religious lights. This was an arbitrary practice and also an ominous harbinger of the way that society was becoming increasingly classified along religious lines in Calcutta. One of some wealthy Bengalis hardened their skins in the face of such overwhelming calamity. Flourishing hotels revealed the stark differences of income in 1943. Just beyond the grand staircases and entrance halls of hotels, an emaciated famine victim might lie on the street facing death. The social gulf became inescapable as guests summoned their drivers or enjoyed sumptuous meals, dancing or chatting to the accompanying tinkle of a jazz piano. Expensive hotels thrived, kept afloat by military spending. In some of the big European hotels, 17 course dinners being served today, reported Jyoti Bose, while lean, emaciated faces can be seen staring through the windows. The famine exposed the rift between Indians and the profiteering of the wealthy was also censured. But then and now, the horrors of the famine elude full understanding. Many contemporary onlookers were also frozen by their own sense of ineptitude and lack of power. The man, woman or child at the heart of the story slinks into the margins and melts away from view. The voices of the famine are still muted in the historical record. In compared to partition, which happened four years later, the famine victims have often remained undifferentiated, lacking distinctive faces, personalities and desires. And certain voices, when you're working in the archive, always um, sound very loud, journalists and bureaucrats and businessmen. But these were people directly less affected by famine. So the experiences of the famine victims couldn't be easily hitched to national narratives or the ta case taken up by agonistic political leaders. Nonetheless, many witnesses reeled with shock and outrage and their words are often a powerful testament. The impression it made on me will persist throughout my life, wrote Sachin Basu. I said even on me, because I thought I was a sophisticated hard-boiled egg and could take a detached view of things. He'd returned to India after taking part in the campaigns of North Africa and after captivity as a prisoner of war. But witness a baby, barely two years old, lying in the lap of his brother of about six, um, so devitalised that they're not even able to move from the street corner and biding their time to be shifted, either dead or alive. People were stunned into silence or bewilderment by what they saw, and this silence continues to haunt the historical record. Politicians, either in prison or reluctant to become involved by association, stayed strangely muted about the famine. Um, propaganda and global image remained the priority. 
The governor wrote, I hope we can get some effective propaganda to counteract the present unhelpful tales of horror in the press, which manifests itself largely in photographs which might have been taken in Calcutta at any time during the last 10 years. And just to, to, to sort of finish up, I've just moved to the last section, which is, is the one question which lingered, which was why? Why had this tragedy taken place? Were, were human errors culpable for death on this scale? Could it have been prevented? Now, histories of the famine have always acknowledged the war as the backdrop of 1943. And for contemporaries, the war and the famine were completely entwined to interlinked horrors which had destabilised life and broken down the moral economy of the, of the Bengali peasant. Um, for the Raj, the preservation and prosecution of the war was the most important consideration. For the famine victims themselves, the war was often cited as the, as the cause of their plight also. In a general sense, the war had distorted local markets, and whatever the direct causation, the fears of bombing, rations for factory workers, the severance of rice reply, supply from Burma, military demands, and the general war economy were inextricably linked to Bengal's trauma. At the same time, India wasn't regarded as an official war zone. The United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, for instance, which had been established to help civilian victims of war, didn't consider Bengal within its remit. So Bengal was caught at the administrative um, interstices of war between civilian and mil military control, between a, a provincial government and a national government, and, and both being too slow to recognise the crisis. <laughs> Now, the greatest controversy continues about the actual available food in Bengal in 1943 and the role of hoarders and traders. Um, others have debated the role of the provincial government or the callousness of a government in London which denied shipping and um, shipping space for imports uh, that could have perhaps potentially alleviated some of the famine victims towards the end of the famine. Amartya Sen published his classic work on food availability decline um, and some decades later, scholarly controversies about the famine's causes still rage on. He argued, to put it simply, that the hoarding of food by black marketeers and more affluent traders um, and inequalities in distribution were to blame, rather than a sheer sort of a blanket absence of food. So the nub of the debate turns on how much food was actually available. Others have fiercely defended the idea, though, more recently, that enough food was simply not available and that attempts to dig out the secret hidden hoards came to nothing, because there just wasn't enough there. Um, the government suspected the role of hoarders and arranged inspections in order to root out the hidden mountains of grains suspected to be locked away in shops and in warehouses. But this campaign found far less hidden stock than expected. The figure of the unnamed hoarder became a bogeyman of the colonial state and was also cited by provincial ministers as a culprit. But in reality, this idea was heavily contested even at the time. Statements that people have concealed foodstuffs in jungles or removed them by boats are utterly incredible, declared one newspaper. A range of other causes have to be factored in, beyond these crucial but somewhat narrow debates about supply. Cover-ups and tardy responses, poor leadership, press censorship and propaganda, a breakdown in communications, and the inability to distribute by rail, road or boat. Um, some... Um, I'll just uh, skip over this bit. Um, yeah, sure, I'll just, I'll just finish up. The lack of international relief or rapid assistance from Britain um, and the reliance on a monocrop culture all compounded people's vulnerabilities. Administrative bungling and inadvertent stockpiling compounded the horrors. Many years later, um, people remembered rail stations, for instance, where grain had been left but um, hadn't, the, the this rolling stock hadn't been in place in order to then sort of move it, move it forwards. The Food Secretary told Wavell in early 1944 that the crux of alleviating the famine was now to get stocks of food into districts in time. Even getting civil, civil telephone and telegraph messages was proving more difficult. So just to end, the debates about why the famine happened may be never fully resolved. The statistical data may be too unreliable and incomplete to be ever fully conclusive. Illegal stockpiling at certain times and places may have occurred, but more significant than this was the importance of mentalities. Some people's lives were not seen worthy of preserving. The state was geared in every way to the war and prioritised this at all costs. Human negligence and human failure to prioritise other human lives as equal was the root cause. Certain lives weren't seen as worthy of mourning or as fully valid as others.
um, and that is there really does seem to be a lot of factors that, that, that are also applied to the Irish famine of the 1840s, which was also a British imperial famine. And um, it's not that the uh, British government set out to deliberately starve the Irish. They somehow allowed it to happen in a very hands-off way. Yeah. And they weren't sufficiently motivated to save those people who were starving. That was, I think, the great moral crime there. They didn't try hard enough to stop it happening. Uh, it happened for reasons of monoculture and various other reasons that are very much uh, represented here, do you think? Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, I think there is similar, um, similar issues in terms of the sort of famine alleviation, that, that kind of, mm. because there's one thing is the actual famine started, and then there's the actual what you do to try and sort it out once it's started. And, um, in, you know, it's very well and clearly documented that Wavell and the administrators in Delhi were asking for more shipping space from London. And they got about a quarter of the, the amount that they asked for, and they were asking for food imports. Now, of course, in London, they were making decisions about the whole, um, the whole kind of imperial context, about the whole war, they're, they're weighing up um, the entire scene, and they're having to make different decisions and different priorities. But it did actually result in further deaths taking place in 1944. You know, those could have been alleviated by importing these stocks that were being asked for. So um, in that sense, there is that sort of, it's not an intentional, um, it's not, it, as you say, it's not, it's not an intent, intention to kind of cause famine or to, to not alleviate <coughs> famine, but at the same time it's about priorities and about, um, mm. about a sort of, a, an attitude, I think, that in, in, in 1940, very much in London, and Churchill's attitude was very much geared around, um, you know, the war being prioritised at every every single turn. And as it turns out, you have three million people dying in the Bengal famine, but you only have 89,000 Indian Army casualties. <laughs> so the the kind of discrepancy between civilian loss of life and military loss of life is really really stark. Um, I think, I mean, in Ireland, it's much closer. So the and there's far less sort of reason for people to have not known about what was happening. Plus, obviously, that in the 1840s, uh, well, technology was way behind the 1940s, but there wasn't uh, a U-boat war against shipping no, going on no, as well so, at the same time. Yeah, so the, uh, I mean, the, I think the Irish case, as, as much as I know about it, I mean, it's far more, um, there's, there's far more responsibility for Britain mm. to actually act quickly. Um, because I mean, within the Indian context, there's also there aren't there are areas in India that aren't aren't, under, aren't starving, but they're living it for, very sort of precariously. They're sort of on a, on a very precarious um, edge in, in the 1940s. But um, the, the there's no redistribution really attempted properly within the actual country itself either. I was fascinated that there isn't an imposition of rationing. How extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. And the question that pops into my mind is one of comparative histories, because I, I, interestingly, golly, I work on this in a French media, and I wonder if colonial French Africa has any of the same issues. And it's even more complex with the Vichy and occupied zone question. But it led me to ask, is this unique to Bengal districts? Yeah. To what extent do the whole of the inter-subcontinent have different regimes in place with that kind of odd um, continuation of the separatist Raj regimes? Mm -hmm. But also, are there terrifying issues here about the different, if you will, shades of colonialism? Does New Zealand or, or other sort of later Commonwealth cultural contexts, uh, do they get mapped into a rationing culture that manages some of these issues in a different way across colour lines? Or, yeah. or is this uh, a feature distinctive to the history of the Indian subcontinent? Um, yeah, it's really amazing that rationing didn't... I mean, they did start rationing in 1944, but it, it never covered more than um, about a third of the whole population. Um, and, and some of the reasons given for that were just the sort of administrative scale of the operation, just the, term, the, the population numbers and the, the ways that you'd have to do it, but also some sort of political 
resistance because of um, you know effects on price and, and, and purchasing price from merchants. And I mean, what you find in in the Indian context is compared to Britain, things like taxation, interventions with industry, um, kind of, you know, making big capital sort of you know play its part in the war doesn't really doesn't really happen in India in the same way. The state defers more to the interests of the moneyed, if you like. So um, that's a kind of classic Im imperial formation because they rely on those groups to help prop up the, the legitimacy of the state. So they, they tend to um, not tax big landowners, not tax big industry, um, not um, not challenge them too much, and rationing was was resisted by some of those groups. So that answers that. I don't know very much about the other imperial context. Apart from, I know, I mean, Algeria in, in 1943 was also um, verging on famine. I mean, there were very, very serious food shortages. And of course, you know, China has a famine also in the middle of the Second World War. There's, I mean, food is really a problem from about the late 1930s into the early 1950s in large parts of the world. You know, just yields are not high enough, people population is growing and there's just not enough enough food in in large parts of large parts of the world through through that whole period. But I think as you say, um, you know, some it's about the sort of state that's in place and how it manages that as as well as the actual um, sort of agricultural context as well. Can I ask a follow on that? With this issue of agriculture, yeah. I mean, the argument, as I understand it, is always that Ukraine and the famines in the 30s yeah. are about collective farming. Mm. Are there any issues about agricultural production that pertain here, distinctive to Bengal? Because uh, that's always so ideologically burdened with the Stalinist moment. Yeah. I'm wondering how does that play itself out in this um, I mean, there's no collectivization or anything like that. There's been no forced changes at, at all. And Bengal has had major famines before as well. I mean, it, it had a really serious one in the 1890s. And um, the, the point that's always made, I suppose, by Indian nationalists is that since independence and since democracy, there hasn't been a famine on that scale. <laughs> and so um, the, 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 the things like food supply um, um, and ration shops and fam the sort of application of state-centered measures sort of avert that in the later part of the, of the of the 20th century, um, and I mean there, there there was a problem. I mean, just people weren't, you, people were just at that edge of subsistence, and then it, one flood, one cyclone, one um, bad, you know, there were a series of things that compounded the problem um, in terms of people's yields not being good. And in post-independence India, obviously, there was massive effort to try and actually improve agricultural production in terms of higher yielding crops and different farming methods and ways that you can actually get people to, to grow more on the same amount of land. Um, I think we probably ought to move on, but we've got a bit of time at the end, is that okay? okay? <laughs> Thank you, yes, Thank you. yeah, great. Now it's Anna's turn. <laughs> Right, well, as somebody once said, now for something completely different. <laughs> um, I'd like now, I'm actually going to sing for you, I'd like to sing a, a piece of music that I've, I've written, I've spent a lot of time preparing this. I'm not going to. Now, in that brief few seconds when you thought I was going to sing for you my own composition, I expect you felt a variety of emotions, including embarrassment, nervousness, <laughs> and... If I had some to you, you'd have felt some other things as well. Pain, embarrassment, nervousness. <laughs> I don't have a particularly good voice, or I don't now. But would it have been dangerous? Would my singing to you, a composition of my own, have been dangerous? Well, the answer, sitting here, standing here now, is no. But the book that I'm writing at the moment explores exactly why what I just proposed was dangerous for centuries. I'm going to try and use my few minutes to explain why that was so um, and give you a few examples and then I'm going to end by in praise, coming back to Dave's opening point, in praise of interdisciplinarity because as Dave pointed out um, I began my life as an English literature lecturer and my uh, time here in Oxford as an English literature lecturer Not quite your life. Not quite my life, you're right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Um, and yet yeah, here am I writing a book about music. So we'll come back to interdisciplinarity and why this department is wonderful later on. But I will read some extracts first. I'm going to stay standing, otherwise I uh, won't keep going. For millennia, and I use that, don't use that term lightly, it has been asserted that a woman's voice is at best distracting, at worst, at worst, dangerous, always inherently sexual. The sexualization of women's music is ancient and enduring. It's ratified by the pronouncements, if not the practices, of the three great religions of Western Europe. Within Islam, the prohibitions against music extend to both sexes. I include Islam as one of the three great religions of Western Europe, because I've got a long time frame. But men are warned particularly against the music of women because, and I quote, singing and music are enchantment for adultery. The book of Samuel states that listening to a woman's voice is sexual enticement. And this was enough to silence women in synagogue and in church, if not beyond. An early Christian father recommended that nuns should sing their prayers but make no sound, so that their lips move but the ears of others do not hear. In a world in which a nun was urged to silent prayer for fear of creating sexual desire, it was a fairly easy step to link the playing of a musical instrument with prostitution. I know, it's a leap, but it was made. An early Renaissance moralist spells it out. Rather than being a good woman and being taught to place her hands upon the spindle, so making nice things, a female musician stretches them out upon the lyre. String instrument. Not only that, she is paid for the pleasure she gives, making her, in effect, a prostitute, since she is, and I quote, exploiting the licentious potential of her own body. And indeed, once her own body is exhausted, she will initiate others, and therefore assume power over other young women as the teacher of similar deeds. Now, alongside this sexualization of music making, there was this was kind of reinforced by a potentially crippling divide between private and public music. It runs like a seam through the history of women's creativity. As far back as ancient Greece, as many of you will know here, there are vase paintings depicting respectable women playing certain instruments in domestic interiors, while, and I'm not quite sure how to say this, heterai, courtesans, who are also often slaves, play musical instruments in public. Later, religious prohibitions and social mores merely enforced an age-old division between women's and men's spheres. And this is the crucial thing, was spatial transgressions again and again defined as sexual transgressions. Put simply, and rather simplistically, for any creative woman to enter the public sphere is to step into the territory of the courtesan. Now, if the public sphere is dangerous in that way, to a woman's reputation, then the private sphere becomes a gilded cage. It's not particularly noticeable in the 19th century, but it happens earlier as well. Um, in fact, the quote that I have uh, comes from uh, much earlier from Castiglione, Mr. Renter quote from the Italian Renaissance, uh, <laughs> who says, music is indeed well suited to women, and perhaps also to others who have the appearance of men, but not to real men. <laughs> For the latter ought not to render their minds effeminate and afraid of death. This is fundamental anxiety about music making and how it makes you effeminate. Um, and therefore needs to be, and if the female space is the home, it needs to be kept in the home. I can give you lots of other examples, but they're just a bit depressing. Now, in the face of this, I wanted to write a book about women composers in the Western classical tradition. But I didn't want to write, and I'm absolutely not equipped to write, and I'll talk about that a bit more at the end, yet another recuperative scholarly exercise. Yeah, here are 6,000 women composers, look, they existed. But that doesn't seem to change much in the way we understand women in music. Uh, nor did I want to, in the quote of one scholar, I like this, to rewrite music history on the principle of add women and stir. So the idea that you can just change the narrative by just adding a few women in. Instead, and this was hugely ambitious, uh, but I haven't regretted it for a minute, I wanted to explore for myself, as a non-specialist, the, the landscapes of belief 
what we in this room might call the ideologies, but I should explain, I'm writing this book for a non-specialist readership with a trade publisher. And if I can get across the idea of ideology by using a phrase such as landscapes of belief, then I will do that. So I want to look at the landscapes of belief or the ideologies that constructed women, woman, in a particular way to make composition at best difficult, at worst dangerous. So what is so dangerous about being female and a composer? Now there's no short answer, and anything I say tonight will be reduced to a few sound bites, but I do just want to give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about, how it impacts upon individual women. The first example regards a woman called Francesca Caccini. Uh, she worked, was highly successful. She was the top paid musician at the Medici court, 17th century Florence. Really interesting composer, fantastic. I urge you to listen to her music if you like that kind of thing. And Franca Francesca Caccini uh, was celebrated in a very, very large book called something like The Nobility of Women. Women. It's got one of those long 17th century titles. Um, that have been commissioned by her patrons, the Medici women, and they wanted to show their power by showing what a good female composer they had at their service. And, so I'll read from the book here, a perfect, all-powerful, even godlike Caccini becomes part of a sustained public relations exercise designed to legitimise the Medici princess's power. I could talk more about that, but they're trying to hold on to power as women. And so far, so good. But the book, the praise of Caccini, insists, over insists, it's just relentless about Caccini's virtue, her honesty, her chastity, her continence. These phrases just come up over and over again. And that insistent points up the elephant in the room, the fear of precisely the opposite qualities which were traditionally located in the body of the music-making woman. As one contemporary put it, expressing a formula found throughout the writings of the time, when music combined with visual beauty, it served as a double invitation to the pleasures and dangers, our word, of love, for body and soul were thus twice besieged, and rational man deprived of its physical senses. You know, these poor men, they're going to be besieged, and they're going to lose their body and soul. Every female musician operated in the shadow of this image, the lascivious whore who used music as a form of entrapment, destroying rational man. And this explains why female singers were subjected to so-called virginity tests, um, in an attempt to stave off the kind of horror of unchastity associated with their art. And physiological phys evidence, if only they had evidence-based healthcare then, they would have been <laughs> slightly, slightly more troubled by this, was drafted in to support these views. Um, chastity was seen as a moral category and as a physical state. Um, and I'm very conscious that I've got a highly trained midwife here, and I'm going to use the word uterus in my next sentence. So <laughs> if I get this wrong, you can, you can, you can put me right later. Okay. Um, chastity, being chaste, not having sex, was understood as a condition of the uterus. And the uterus was often understood in the 17th century in terms of the throat. Um, you can tell, explain why later on. Then it was an easy step to imagine the throat, and I quote, as the sieve through which chastity leaked out in the world and which rendered singing an activity that could prove the singer anything but chaste. I didn't make this up. Um, there, there are other things connected with tying umbilical cords and all sorts of things um, and jokes about tongues, but we won't go there now. Now, a whole range of treatises, and we're still talking about the 17th century, dealt with the problem of the female voice, even when the female in question was considered virtuous. And, I, and these treatises and this culture in which Francesca Caccini worked not only make it remarkable that she was an acclaimed singer, she had to walk on a kind of tightrope of, as I say, uh, honesty, chastity, continence, um, but that she composed, which is to take things to the next stage, and actually creating music and very fine music. Go forward two centuries and look at a composer called, who's the sister of Felix Mendelssohn, who is very famous. Uh, she was called Fanny Mendelssohn, and she married a lovely man called Wilhelm Hensel. Um, so she called Fanny Hensel. And I just want to read you a moment, um, uh, a paragraph about Fanny Hensel, uh, which actually is, um, I could have spent 
all the evening talking about kind of gilded cage in which she lived in, immense wealth, immense privilege, a very protected environment, and all her family wanted to do was protect her from that dangerous public world that would destroy her. And all she wanted to do was compose. The forgetting of Fanny Hensel sometimes had very little to do with gender. Um, revol she died, tragically, very young in 1847. Revolution came to Prussia, where she lived, in 1848, and the previous decades were lost to sight in the political struggles that followed. A handful of Hensel's works, including, we don't need to know the details, they were published in 1850, but her moment had well and truly passed. In the 20th century, even if anyone had shown an interest in Felix's little big sister, actually, the Nazis sought to wipe the Jew Mendelssohns off the German cultural map. But at the time of her death, something else was going on, the immediate time of her death. Reviewers faced the posthumous publications, kept their comments short, and they focused on her dependence upon her brother, and they were just plain and simply unable to look past her gender. And I know we're running out of time, but there's an example uh, from 17th century Venice of the composer Barbara Strozzi, which provides a remarkable and really quite um, shocking example of people unable to look past a woman's gender. Couldn't look past her gender, or more precisely, couldn't look past their, their own ideas of what a woman was capable of composing. I'll just give you a couple of quotes. Again, it does get a bit depressing. Um, her songs might not betray a woman's hand, they might even suggest an artistic study of masculine seriousness, but nevertheless, they lack a commanding individual idea, or else clear phrasing. I could give you other examples. The key point being that simply by being female, they didn't have that kind of depth of understanding, that intellectual grasp, that rationality that could produce great music. Conviction is another word. They go powerful feeling drawn from deep, deep conviction. And as ever, it was not just the critics who believed they could detect uh, someone's gender in their music. Clara Schumann, who's slightly younger than um, Fanny Hensel, became her friend, sort of, in the final years of her, Fanny Hensel's life. She admired uh, the senior composer as a person, despite her rather brusque manner. Clara Schumann did not believe in being brusque, but doubted her ability as a composer because, and I quote, women always betray themselves in their compositions. Um, I have three more minutes. Thank you. I might not get onto my celebration of cross-disciplinarity. Clara Schumann's comment says more about her than it does about Fanny Hensel. But these and similar assumptions go deep within the Western classical tradition. It was Fanny Hensel's misfortune to be living in, indeed assimilated into, a Protestant German haute bourgeoisie whose values would come to dominate the Western classical music tradition in the 19th century from Central Europe to North America, and again, we take those values for granted, but they originate in a specific time and place. At first sight, previous era's insistence on silence or their equation of composition with prostitution seem long gone. The female musician is now, there I said, a domestic goddess. Women's music confined to the home, an accompaniment literally a metaphoric of family life. The piano is the hearth, is the altar of the home. This idea would prove to be a poison chalice just as women composers began to escape the shadow of the courtesan, the new challenge would be to gain access to the great, new, and crucially public arenas for classical music, the opera houses, the concert halls of Europe and North America. And writing my book, I realized that for Hensel's successors, up to this very day, that remains the final frontier. I can give you examples, if you wish, either informally over drinks or now, about the different strategies that individual women over the centuries used to sort of fly under the radar to get what the job done, um, including performing a kind of exemplary motherhood. Clara Schumann had eight children. Uh, she didn't look after them. She kept on kind of performing motherhood and then going off on international concert tours. Um, I've, I've mentioned the interesting example of Barbara Sorozzi in Venice and her failure to convince people that she was anything other than basically a pair of breasts. Now, I am going to use my last minute to talk about uh, what on earth I'm doing as an English literature specialist. Uh, I did have an interest in training back in the day. I did a master's in history and literature, and I wanted to do that because I couldn't, I, I couldn't understand the literature I was reading without understanding the history. And the two have always interplayed uh, with each other. Um, the talk this evening, I was 
very tempted to completely rewrite my entire paper on the basis of what I've heard tonight and massively outside my discipline. So I share David's appreciation of what this department brings. There is a danger to it, and some of you in this room may have experienced that danger, that academia still doesn't quite know what to do with cross-disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity. And somehow it's frightened of the amateur straying into the wrong place. If you're not an expert, how come you're not right now? And I would simply say one, one thing in defense of discipline hopping is that the archive is still there. The evidence is still there. If you discipline hop, you could ask your own questions, questions of your discipline, of an archive that's been looked at by people who've been asking their questions. And out of that can come some very, very interesting work. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Is this on? I think it's on. Um, one thing that occurs to me, I mean, please don't uh, move just yet, Anna, because I think we can ask for some questions to you that other speakers have had to themselves before going into any general discussion. But there is a danger, isn't there? Pop, one aspect of danger is not doing something. It's Doing something is often seen as dangerous, but not doing it can be equally dangerous in the long run, can't it? Yeah. Um, Actually, one of the people I didn't, I didn't manage to talk about is um, a Viennese composer called Mariana von Martinez, who was possibly one of the most prolific composers of the 18th century. She was in the Mozart of Vienna, and very young Beethoven, and what have you. She's absolutely the right place, right time. And she was quite celebrated in her own city. Uh, she never moved from a kind of 100 meter square bit in the mm. absolute elite center of, 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 of Vienna. And she refused every invitation to go to Italy or to London or wherever, where all her male contemporaries were going, because it wouldn't have been profit, it wouldn't have been safe. She, they were, she actually used words like risk, danger, I'm not going mm. to do this. And it meant that she was never, I mean, there were various very practical things, like she was never awarded a particular prize, because she'd have had to go to the city to defend it. Mozart did, he was 14, he could do it, but she couldn't when she was 40, because she was all. So not doing that kind of passivity, if I just stay very, very still, mm. They won't notice that I'm a girl. Didn't actually help her in the long run at all. But she still kept writing music. Any questions or comments for Anna? I wonder if there's an interesting gender in there. And if one thinks of the sort of elite core within choral societies, the apogee of femininity is to be the highest soprano. To be a mezzo is to be a minuet. Whereas to be a castrato is to exactly to engage the countertenor anxieties about virility. I wonder to what extent does the nature of musical composition also, if I think of the parallel from my own field, it's perfectly appropriate for a woman to be an accomplished, and a chosen word there, accomplishment, a uh, embroiderer or fashion designer. To enter the domains of architecture or industrial design is to problematize that quasi-private public positioning of craft. Yeah. Is there a particular similar tension that if you're a leader writer, mm. that's still suitable to us? Yes. A, uh, there, there are suitable genres for, for women to, to be work in. Concert yeah. pian uh, uh, well, symphony writer, maybe. The symphony also? and the op opera are the two big no-nos. And they become, given the German tradition, mm. and Italian as well, but German became the popular dominant one. They become those benchmarks. If you haven't written your symphony, you're not a great composer. If you haven't, if you're not in opera, you're not going to be a successful composer. Um, as put rather simplistically, but so women have to keep working in, as somebody described in miniatures mm -hmm. and uh, miniature forms, and they simply don't have access. They can't go. They haven't got an orchestra. They cannot be made Kapellmeister. They can't. Um, they can't take the positions. And Barbara Strozzi, I've now mentioned so many times, you, you're, I hope you're desperately interested in her. Um, she's, she's working in, in Venice at a time when uh, you know, there are incredible musical posts to be had. And she's just as good as the contemporaries, but she simply cannot have those. She cannot even get anywhere near. She can't work for a church. She can't work for the, the Venetian uh, state. So um, 
that, yeah, so the issue of the genre is the forms in which women can work. They are very confined, they're very small, they are domestic. And instruments, instruments as well. Um, the piano is acceptable. Uh, when I read about this, I suddenly realized that my sense because it doesn't distort the woman's body. She can stay sitting, it's just the movement of the hands. Even the violin only became acceptable by the end of the 19th century. But Jacqueline uh, Dupre in the cello. Oh, something that people like snow, and let alone wind instruments, no. Um, and again, you'll see that divide still in orchestras now. It is just beginning to break down. But um, there are certain instruments that, that women uh, were allowed to play. Yeah. Yes, I, I won't repeat the quote of Mr. Thomas Beecham about. <laughs> the cello was important. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. I wanted to pick up your point, Anna, about um, the value of interdisciplinarity, yes. because um, being a largely unqualified, uneducated, polymathic, inclined person, um, I've always found that to be incredibly rewarding as an approach to to subjects. In other words reading into them, uh, whatever level, uh, the scanning of the environment in which the context that they're, they're either being taught or even being read mm. is, is always gives an extra value. And I have found that sometimes this isn't reflected in, in, in the other spaces that I see between subjects. For some bizarre reason, um, in the silo management of the yeah. teaching and education. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm looking a fascinated way as ever um, at the three presentations we've had and how the interdisciplinarity there has brought up, for instance, in the first, and this is entirely my own concept, um, we've got the, the, um, the almost um, vine definitions mm. of danger. Yeah. In the first, with Marion, it was very much the perceived danger. Um, shared decision making and sometimes in fact frankly probably in an emergency situation decision that has to be made almost regardless um, at certain stages in the process of birth where the medical view has to prevail and that is not ever questioned very rarely particularly if the outcome is optimal um, that in a way is a danger that therefore is almost professionally governed um, by, by both instinct and knowledge and need not happen, quote, <laughs> subject to the medical conditions you, you were talking about, which would need to be diagnosed initially. We didn't really, that's going to be a very fascinating area when you get deeper into your, your more qualitative stuff. Um, the other definition, I would say, is um, the one that Yasmin gave on the... Um, almost the embedded historical endemic nature of danger, mm. where you have in a, an area where there's a natural deficiency in diet, there's a historical acceptance, there is a highly embedded cultural elite mm. approach yeah. where anything can go. There's a very interesting book by Matthew Sweet which looks at the role of the hotels in London during the Blitz. And they would see almost exactly the same thing, literally. You know, the, um, the, the, the starved faces pressing into the windows of the Ritz as they junketed um, while the, the sirens were wailing in a sort of semi-safe situation. And then lastly, um, I would extract from your last presentation, Anna, the, the, the danger of belief and prejudice. Mm where you have both religion pressure, religious pressure, and judicial gender pressures mm. that, are, that have often deprived people mm. of development. Yes, but I, I'm, mm. I totally agree. And uh, as you can tell, I was rushing towards the end. But again, one of the things that I hope to talk about is that these, the landscapes of the belief, the ideas of the cultures these women are working at, are sometimes there's nothing compared to the list of dangers. In fact, I was going to start with the list of dangers, you know, famine, plague, childbirth, full stop. Um, you know, just the risk of every next baby that you had. And Mariana von Martinez in Austria did not marry. And one of the reasons I suspect she did not marry was to you know, keep, um, keep herself protected from the dangers of childbirth. 
in, in that era. Um, so, yeah, the, the material problems are always, or the challenges are always interlinked. Because wonderful. Yeah, I think all the congratulations yeah. to this for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more points after that very, very uh, welcome summation of the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Adrian? <laughs> yes. I think we'll let Adrian have a go. You mentioned the dangers of interdisciplinary. Yes. And the other point you alluded to earlier was that you were engaging with the public with this publication. Yes. That seems to be the other yes. danger or the other thing that must be done, but the other dangerous thing. Yeah. And it seems to me that it's potentially probably quite dangerous for all three of the speakers in, in healthcare, but how, how your message yeah. is, is interpreted and got across to the public and patients. In, in your case, how will your this idea of landscapes of belief? What are you trying to do with the, with the public? What is actually your, your target there? And, yes. and similarly, for the Yasmin area, of, of very. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where there are all sorts of ways in which your work could be represented and misrepresented when taken into, into different publics. So, if just if the three of you just mm -hmm. had a comment on that danger of how your research and your ideas en engage with this uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, really, uh, <laughs> um, okay. Well, I, yeah, I mean, this is, is, is meant to be part of a trade book as well, and, and it is going to kind of, you know, hopefully be read by people who aren't specialists in the field. And I am really nervous about it because it's, you know, these are extremely con you know, contentious issues, and, and particularly, I mean, there's two different audiences as well because there's, an, there's a reading public in, in India who reads in, that reads in English. And the more I look at the 1940s, the more I see that there are just two completely different narratives of what was happening. You know, and you're you're sort of have, you're just having to sort of take your own position and hope and, and kind of t and, and try and maintain it and hope that hope for the best. And I mean, and I think the only thing you can say in terms of as a researcher that you can try and do is make sure that you're as uh, on as solid ground as you possibly can and that you've got the conviction of your beliefs because you've done as much research behind whatever material sort of goes out into the world um, as you can that you, that you feel on solid ground um, but it is a risk yeah there is a there is a danger and I think it is it is different to just speaking to a kind of a more select specialized audience because you you are um, Risking political controversy or um, mis being misunderstood, being willfully misunderstood, which is, you know, can can easily easily happen. Um, and and it's there's there's certain dangers all around at the moment in the Indian publishing context. I and mean, you've probably read this book by Wendy Doniger, who's a very sort of major professor at Chicago, who was was um, pulled by Penguin India earlier this year and pulped. Um, and, and has been banned, you know, well, it hasn't been banned, but they just basically withdrew it from the market because it was seen to be religiously controversial and, and offensive to Hindus. And, you know, the publishers, that, those sorts of things do occur. So it's not, um, you know, there are real, real dangers. People, out there. absolutely, there are some very difficult areas for historians, yeah. dangerous areas. Yeah, dangerous areas. People of, you know, Armenian genocide, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, you can be impersonal. Full, full on danger if you write about that kind of stuff and it gets, it comes out in, the, in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. I propose a counter narrative there that there are also the great virtues if one's attempting to construct something which is lost to history but part of collective memory. That that public audience, I'm not proposing crowdsourcing, but that there are lost narratives and evidences that that communication with the wider public can generate a return dialogue that will provide you new research evidence in a really exciting and positive way that you do potentially get the scary person who wants to stab you because of what you read but there is also potentially a whole set of uh, evidence out with the archive that is hugely important to actual historical experience that that public dialogue generates, which I would say is the virtue of putting oneself out into that dangerous space. Well, I was, I was going to yeah. turn back to Marion's work, and you actually want to listen to the women, mm -hmm. don't you? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's your evidence. And somehow the medical establishment need to be 
to do that. Yeah. To do, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, yeah, the what, one of the most challenging for me is that um, it is there are so many type of positions. Why am I looking at spotting? That is exactly every time I'm getting that. And um, the, the main reason is that there is so much literature on spotting and how natural it is and the benefits. But we always for that is what I'm finding that we we always focus on the the risk factor, which is not it may not even be a risk. We haven't gone deep enough to find out why is this risk not a, why is it not a risk in one lady but not the other so uh, the mechanism as the mechanism of labor as i say that um, if a woman is lying down on the bed what is the mechanism of labor in that situation is it the same as when a woman is squatting is it different so what makes it i, I have to find out why do i really feel that uh, squatting could benefit women. And um, the only other thing is that the benefits really outweighs the, the risk. And there is something we can do. Um, as, as a risk, there is a probability. It is finding that probability of not having this risk. Uh, that is really what I would want to find out. And the good thing is that there are midwives there and women there who know that it does not have this risk. However, there are those who have just read and never had any experience and they don't really, I wouldn't want to to do it if I know there is a risk. I, I, mean, I know that nobody wants to exercise anything if they know that there is a risk. So they just say that is a no-go area. Whereas some women can come and say, I want to squat. And I, I think that is where I got this this uh, sort of um, uh, urge to do this. Some women come in and they just want to, to squat. And we don't know, sometimes you, you have to ask them to do another different sport, a different position, which suits you, not that it suits women. So those are the things which, are, which need to be highlighted. For these few women who choose to squat, they also are entitled to have quality care. They are not supposed to be left without quality care. So I'm looking at the minority, and this minority might inform the majority. That is my way of thinking. All right, I think we probably ought to finish up. Any more quick points? Anyone, who, particularly anyone who hasn't spoken yet? We can have a drink. Yeah. Well, that's the next. That's the next thing. We shall um, <laughs> squat down to the common room <laughs> and have a drink. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.